Hallelujah. Everybody stand up for a minute. <laughs> Gives me time to find my page. First of all, let me say I'm so very honored uh, to be a part of the team that's ministering to you. I haven't seen such depth, such hunger, such um, a love for the people that are being ministered to. And thank you, Pastor Folake. Uh, I want to thank you particularly because you insisted that I be here. And I think I'm the one that's blessed for it. Let's just say a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the rich feast that you have set before us. Thank you for everyone that has ministered here. Thank you for the life that you have imparted. Thank you for the fact that you're here with us and that you're touching hearts and you're reaching into deep recesses of our soul. We simply ask you, Holy Spirit, to come and tabernacle and do that which only you can do. We're all standing here, but we're here also with needs, many that are unspoken. But because you're the one that reads the hearts of men, we give you praise that those needs shall be met in the name of Jesus. Please be seated. <laughs> Hallelujah. I hope this doesn't keep going up. I've done it again. Oh, I've come with my hair. God will forgive me. <laughs> Amen. You know, I want to change the topic a little bit. You know, we're talking about the king's daughters. And I want to talk about when the king's daughter is not a princess. Many times we assume that all king's daughters are princesses. But then we have the Mephibosheths that are forgotten in places called Lodibas. So I want to talk to, you know, this afternoon about when the king's daughter is not a princess. But I'm going somewhere before we get there. You know, we have many um, worthy biblical um, models. We have the Giles, we have the Esthers, we have the Deborahs. These are the ones that we know. These are the ones that we admire. These are the ones we aspire, you know, to be like. And then also in the Christian world, the current trend is um, the marketplace. And the focus is the marketplace. And again, we have many worthy um, models. Uh, the criteria for us usually is their accomplishments, their achievements. They're usually high net worth and net worked people. They're usually ministering on, not ministering, they're global players, as it were, and they're global influencers. And they, they, they um, are nation transformers. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But, you know, Jesus speaking, you, you look at all of those lists, you know, and the things that people have done, and then you look at little old you, as it were. And I've heard so much about self-esteem today because when we... We tend to compare. It doesn't matter what anybody says. We still tend to compare ourselves one with the other. And you look at this list of, you know, accomplished people and you think to yourself, what is my little life going to do? What is it going to affect? What is it going to mean in God's grand scheme of things? And the first thing that Jesus says in Matthew, you know, 19 and 30 is, he says, many who are first will be last. And many who are last will be forced. But the thing is, he does not tell us the criteria, you know, by which he decides who these firsts are that are going to be last and who these lasts are that are going to be first. The other thing that I, you know, the, the questions that I have about the current trend of the things that's going on, particularly in the church world, is are all called to be entrepreneurs? There's a question we have to ask because we're pushing everybody as it were into the marketplace but you need to ask yourself the question am i called to be an entrepreneur is there a place for me you know outside of the marketplace but even in the marketplace but maybe not as an you know entrepreneur as it were and um i want us to go to um revelation and chapter 18 to start with and i'm going to read different verses there i'm reading from verses 1 to 4 11 to 13, 23 and 24. And I'm starting. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Falling, falling is Babylon, the great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. 
For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The king of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. The message puts that verse like this. All nations drank the wild wine of her whoring. Kings of the earth went whoring with her. Entrepreneurs made millions exploiting her. Verse 4 says, Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. Verse 11, The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, because no one buys their cargoes anymore. The message again, Bible says, the traders will cry and carry on because the bottom dropped out of business. No more markets for their goods. And then he begins to list their cargoes. And I want you to see in the list that there is no industry that is not represented. There is no profession that is not represented. It says cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls. That's the money markets. It says fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth. That's the textiles, fashion, entertainment industry. Every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble. That's the building and construction industry or inventions from fine and delicate medical you know, instruments to guns and knives. Um, it talks about cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh, and frankincense. That's the pharmaceutical industry or the health industry. It goes cargoes of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, the food and wine industry, horses and carriages, the transportation industry, and this is the one that gets my goat. It says, human beings sold as slaves and the souls of men. And that's um, religion and the trafficking industry. You know, I said I wanted to talk about when the king's daughter is not a princess. In verse 23, it goes, The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's important people, the great men of the earth. By your magic spell or your sorceries, all the nations were led astray or deceived. The message says, Her traders robbed the whole earth blind and by black magic arts deceived the nations. Verse 24. In her was found the blood of prophets and of God's holy people and of all who have been slaughtered on the earth. You know, sometimes we look at um, incidents that happen in the earth and events that happen in the earth. Sometimes you hear about a mass shooting in a school. Look at the trailer accident that claimed so many lives just, you know, down the road. And sometimes we cannot connect cause with effect. Sometimes we do not understand that we are seen being played out before our eyes. A much more sinister agenda on a global scale, but with individual incidents, as it were. And the Bible says that the blood of anybody that has ever been slain, you will find in Babylon. So what is Babylon? It is an antichrist, global, trade and economic system that snares the nations by sorceries. It says her products span the entire spectrum of human existence and need, and these include the souls and the bodies of men. I have a question for us. What is it that we're after in the marketplace? Spoils or souls? How many people have you harvested? How many souls have been harvested from the marketplace? The entire focus, it would seem, even in the church, is for the monetary gains that we are able to reap. And you need to begin to understand the heart of God, you know, in some of these things. So there are things, I want to give you some statistics about um, Babylon's bestsellers, as it were. The first one is the trafficking, sex, and slave industry. You know, we've heard so much about immorality here and how people cannot seem to master and to contain themselves where morality is concerned. But the Bible says that Babylon is ruled by a spirit of witchcraft. The strength of witchcraft are the blood sacrifices. Somebody listening to me, the strength of witchcraft is immorality. Wherever you find witchcraft, you will find these two activities, immorality and bloodshed. 
So what you are seeing happening in the world, where it appears that everything is going to the dogs, is because that season that God is talking about, we're about entering it in the earth. The deception is over the nations. Um, 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 talking about trafficking, Sometimes you think to yourself, you know, I'm not involved in any of these things. What can I do? You know, it doesn't really come home to me. So, you know, all we can do is pray. The first group of people that are listed as being trafficked is domestic workers. If you have a maid in your house, whether you believe it or not, you're a trafficker. Except you are doing something about the future of that maid. Is somebody listening to me? Because somebody is benefiting from her working with you. And it is not always the worker herself. Then you have agriculture, those that work on farms. You have those that work in the food um, um, service um, industry, like restaurants. You have the begging rings. How many of you have had one of those children come up and knock on, Mommy, God will answer your prayer, and you quickly wind it up. And you're not recognizing that you're seeing more than a child in need. You're seeing more than somebody who is irritating you. You're actually seeing the system of Babylon being established and being entrenched in the earth, close home to you, you know. And then you have the traveling sales crew. Remember the time when girls, you know, were being trafficked in banks in the name of meeting targets? Ha. Huh. You know, I, I'm not sure what it is that has been done about that, whether that is still going on. So all the signs of these things are going on around us. Six to 800,000 people are trafficked annually. 80% are female. 50% are children. Now listen to me. The annual profit from trafficking is $150 billion. Is somebody listening? Annual, not from one time to another. And every year it increases. Currently, it is 150 billion US dollars. So you understand that you're dealing with a global entity. And you know, the Bible says that it uses sorceries to deceive the nations. You know, I'd heard so much being spoken about here that it's as if people can't think anymore. They call good evil and evil good. It is the operation of the sorceries that is over the nations. Oh, hallelujah, somebody. Because we're going to do something about it. And then the second one is drugs. Same thing. The top 10 pharmaceutical industries uh, make profits ranging from 4.1 billion to 13.1 billion annually. Recently, it came close home with the scourge of the um, codeine addiction that's going on here. There was a time when, you know, a very notable foundation um, was... Um, let me use the word peddling because I can't think of a better word now. Um, this um, birth control pill called Depo Provera. And, you know, people welcomed it, you know, willingly, not understanding that those who took it were permanently sterilized and that it was an agenda to curtail the birth rate in Africa to ensure, you know, that, you know, children will not be born again and therefore, um, what's the word, curtail the growth rate. So we, we see things that are happening, but we don't recognize what is behind them. And you see, when you don't understand God's agenda, it is very difficult for you in your purpose to be focused. When we talk about purpose this day, we only talk about personal purpose. Do you understand what I mean? You know, with my purpose, I want to fulfill my... Shem, me, you are fulfilling your purpose. Do you understand what I'm saying? But there's an agenda that you are a part of. There is God's purpose. There is an eternal agenda that's been worked out. Do you know about that and the role you are supposed to play? Because when you do, you won't have a problem with, focus, um, with both focus and purpose. You will understand that wherever you are, light must shine. Wherever you are, darkness must flee. Wherever you are, you must be the one that destabilizes and brings an end to the agenda of darkness there. Are you listening to me, somebody? And you see, because we are not um, um, aware of these things, we are, we are much more focused on ourselves. We've become introspective. 
you know, and we think that our purpose is to set up one business somewhere. Abba. And you set up the business and go, yes, 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 it, it, you know, it, what's the word? It thrives, it prospers and everything. And the Bible tells us that you're trading in Babylon. And he says, those that we're admiring, that are succeeding, you know, the great men, you know, that are succeeding in Babylon, God says they are committing adultery. You, you know, Taba wo perspective, Jesu, you know, some things will not seem quite so enticing anymore. Is somebody listening to me? And this is not, it's, it's not to um, um, spew fear out. It is to help us understand the authority that we have on earth. It is to help us understand the assignment that we have on earth. It's to help us get back in line. We are sleeping. We are playing. You know? And, you know, I, I read some of the Facebook um, posts, you know, after this thing, you know, had happened on there. You know, those that were bind, binding blood-sucking demons were binding them. And the, the, the best we could do was, oh God, comfort, you know, the families, these bereaved families. When is a team going to go there and look at the burnt bodies and say in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk? If you had one incident, is somebody listening to me? Whatever money you can make in the marketplace, the unbeliever can do it far better than you can. That cannot be our focus. Is somebody listening to me? It's not that we will not invade there, but the treasure of the marketplace are the souls and the bodies of men. We must get our priorities right again in the name of Jesus. Tell this phone to stop shutting down. Hallelujah. You know, and of course, the third one is arms. It says here in, in verse uh, 2 um, of Revelation, she has become a dwelling for demons, a hunt for every impure spirit, a hunt for every unclean bird, a hunt for every unclean and detestable animal. This is the environment and the arena of our warfare. The knowledge of how to make sales and profit cannot help you in this kind of arena. Are you listening to me? You must know much more than that. I love, I think it's um, Liza Bevere, when she talks about warriors on stilettos. You must never forget that you are in an eternal warfare that does not end until you close your eyes or you are caught up in glory. Is somebody listening to me? Say hallelujah and smile at me. Amen. So, the other thing I want to talk about is Babylon's modus operandi. It says the system we're operating in kills the prophets and the saints of God. And sometimes it's not physical death. Sometimes it's a death of discernment. We begin to lose that edge that we had for God. We begin to lose that passion that we had for God. Somebody said if you threw a, a, a frog in hot water, it will jump out immediately. He says, but you leave it in cold water and you slowly boil the water, that frog will boil to death. And many of us are being boiled to death because of the sorceries and the witchcrafts and the deception. And one thing I love that I've heard again today, again and again, is we must return to the word of God. That is the, it's the truth that will keep us away from the deception that is going on around in the world. So you must know what Babylon is. You must know why you are there. You must know what you are in there for. You must know how to fight to obtain the real spoil. And then you must know when it's time to leave. The fact that Jesus said, come out of her, my people, means her people, they, they are plenty. And it means that he also knew they would be in there for a season. But there's a time coming when he will tell us, get out of there. So you do not partake in her sins. And when that time comes, don't start telling God about the contract you are still chasing. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. You know, what qualifies you to be his, um, um, uh, his daughter? Your achievements or your accepting the love that he has for you in a spirit, you know, inspired relationship. I want us to go to John chapter 4. And I want, to, I want us to see how Jesus, in quote, goes into... Babylon 
in quote, and brings out one of the treasures in Babylon, as it were. And I think I'm just going to talk through the verses. In John chapter 4, um, starting from verses 4 to 6, um, instead of reading the whole story, you know, I'll, I'll just talk through the verses. It says, now he had to go through Samaria. So he had come to a town in Samaria called um, Sika, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. The first thing you see here was it says he had to go to Samaria. We need to understand that there are some appointments you have that are assignments that have nothing to do with you. There are some things that God is going to ask you to do that you will not benefit one couple from it. Is somebody listening to me? It will be the, the entire benefit will be somebody else's. The Bible talks about others, you know, sowing and planting and doing the hard work and we coming to reap. Some of the time you're going to be the ones that do the planting and the hard work. And you will leave that place and God will send other people to reap that which you have sown. So there are places, there are faces, there are cases. And something I need to say to this generation, this selfie generation, sometimes we don't see the great works of God because some of the greater works of God are done in secret. They are done, you know, the, the, we, we will come to the place again where we will have meetings that don't have cameras where there will be meetings that no media is allowed whatsoever. I laughed, you know, or I smiled to myself when I saw the smoke, you know, rising out. We are so hungry for the things of God. We are so hungry for the glory cloud. As long as I'm seeing this smoke cloud, it will be difficult for me to press in to see the real glory cloud. Is somebody listening to me? We keep substituting instead of waiting and paying the price for the real deal. Are you listening to me? The Bible says the secret of the Lord. There are certain things that God will say only to certain people, to those he knows he can entrust with his secrets. Are you listening to me? The Lord will take you to places in the spirit. The Lord will take you into people's homes and people's rooms. The Lord, you will sit down and, and you'll be talking to someone and the Lord will show you things that they are doing somewhere else. Are you listening to me? But the Bible says that there will be secrets of God. And God will not share his secrets with people who talk. God will not share his secrets with people who post it on social media. Are you listening to me? Every little thing. Mbaba. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. We're going to become a... We, you have to understand the protocols of God. <laughs> you know, you, you don't barge into a king in a palace even if you are his princess. Hallelujah, somebody. Then you need to understand timing. You know, the Bible says it was noon and this lady came at noon. The mere fact that there was a lady at a watering hole at noon tells you there is a story. Most women come to the watering home early in the morning and there's usually a crowd of you know them there. That's where they have their gossip sessions. That's where they meet. That's where they do all of those things at the watering hole. But this woman kinds of strolls there at 12 noon. It tells me immediately that she's trying to avoid those kinds of people. You know, when I say those kinds of people, oh, th there's something about her that doesn't want that she doesn't want the crowd. You know, that's usually and it's not something good. Oh. <laughs> it's like she's there's something she's hiding, and and. Today, I pray I will convey the heart of God to us. You know, you know, I wish to convey the heart of God to us. Whatever is your pain, whatever is your shame, whatever is your need, there are things that you cannot talk about to people. Not only new year long, God will create the environment that will allow you to release it to him. The God we serve is a tender, sensitive God. He knew that there was an issue with this woman. The only reason he went to Samaria was to have an appointment with this woman. Jesus was tired from the journey. 
12 noon meant the sun was scorching. It was at its peak. He sat without a heart because they didn't tell us there was a heart there. In the scorching sun, just waiting for you. Whatever it is that God has got to do to get you where he needs to get you, please be sure he's going to do it. And we as his children, we need to learn to create atmospheres for God to work. We are big on behavior modification, but God wants to change hearts. It doesn't matter the threat, the punishment, whatever it is that you use to get somebody to change their behavior. Once that thing is lifted, they will revert. But God works with changed hearts because he knows that all the issues of life flow from there. The other thing is you need to know your king. Don't let anybody, regardless of the offer, regardless of how good it sounds, regardless of who it is coming from, don't let anybody pull you away from what you know of God. You know, um, 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 we've resorted very much in, in, in um, even in the church, to manipulation, to coercion, you know, to those things. But those are not the tools of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is about love. We wonder why we're not succeeding in getting people to change. The Bible tells me that the only thing that will not fail is love. Sometimes we believe we're preaching hyper grace until you are the one needing that grace. He says, where sin abounds, much more does grace abound. Is it that it gives you a license to sin? No. I think it was Funtos speaking that said that when you are in love with someone, you want to do everything that's right for them. You want to please them like you please no other. Oh, hallelujah. The Bible says there is no fear in love, but that perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not yet made perfect in love. You see, love releases empathy. Love releases compassion. This is where you are touched with the feelings of someone's infirmity, not their strength. The world celebrates strength. The world celebrates achievement and accomplishment. God comes to the weak and the, he says the well don't need a physician. It is the sick that he's been sent to. But if you look at us in Christendom, we tend to avoid the sick and go for the well. We tend to cluster around in groups of those that are whole. Whilst the ones that God, the, 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 the princesses or the, the king's daughters that are not princesses are languishing outside. Somebody recently invited me to a program and, you know, they were like, we want to start early, you know, with the invitations and that sort of thing. And I said to her, I said, stop a minute. Why don't you ask God who he wants at that program? I said, we're so focused on you know, the, the, the reach that we have, the influence that we have. When Jesus called the people that, you know, he thought should come to the banquet and they started giving him excuses, he said, go to the byways and the highways. It is time, O oh church, for us to go to the highways and the byways. We've done enough of internal pampering. And you know, sometimes when you sit down, I think it was Jumoke speaking, and you keep looking at yourself in the mirror, that is when you will notice the spot on your nose. That is when you will notice that your hair is receding. But when you busy yourself with the things that concern God, you see, because what will be reflected to you will be the gratitude and the praise abounding to God on account of the good that you are doing. Is somebody listening to me? You guys are very quiet. Hallelujah. <laughs> In verses 7 to 9, it continues. It says, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Uh, there's so much to say. There's so much to say here. It, it, it starts with the Jews do not associate with the Samaritans. And I want to ask you, who are those people that you don't associate with? Who are those people that kind of bring down your um, um, status, you know, in life? 
who are those people that you have issues with and you have drawn a divide? Maybe it's religious um, 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 beliefs and that sort of thing. Those people tie scarves. Those ones are always telling their enemies to fall down and die. You know, so there's a separation. Who, who are those people that get your goat? Would you, you remember the story that God tells about um, um, the, the guy that fell by the wayside, you know, and it was the Samaritan, you know, the one that was supposedly not his neighbor that helped him. And I look at us and I look at us as a church. And it's if there's anybody reaching out to those that um, are, I don't know what the word is that I want to use. Should it not be us, the church? James and John were so insulted on Jesus' behalf when he had last gone to a Samaritan village, they wanted to call down fire to burn down the whole place. And Jesus said, you don't know of what spirit that you are. Let me ask you a question. If you had the opportunity to help one of the children of the herdsmen that have been wreaking havoc in the land, what would you do? We have to come back to a Christianity that is not preaching words. We have to come back to a Christianity where the rubber meets the road. A Christianity where the people will be the ones to tell us we have love. <laughs> Amen. You know, uh, Jesus did so many things that was socially unaccepted. Number one, you are not supposed to be seen talking to a woman. The Jews don't associate with Samaritans. Women are usually second-class citizens or were in that, you know, culture. And Jesus broke all of those laws, waited for her, we don't know for how long, in order to be able to meet her need. You know, sometimes you look at, um, um, when we talk about children, um, women being second-class um, citi citizens, you say to yourself, that doesn't happen anymore. We're emancipated. You know, we now know our rights. Women are beginning to come to the forefront. Women are rising. People, that's just a few women. Ask the Chibok girls. Ask the women that are being trafficked. Ask the wife who is abused, and society says she must submit to the husband emotionally, physically, psychologically. Ask the women who are being abused by authority figures, whether they are pastors, they are fathers, they are mentors, they are bosses. You know the scandal that we had recently with Harvey Weiner, whatever his name was, and then that U.S. Uh, um, 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 gymnast doctor. And we sit here and we say, don't let's talk about it. And women are dying. These conversations must start. Much more than the conversation starting, we need to go to the women and we need to do something about it. There's no point in telling a woman to remain in an abusive situation until you say, oh, she, oh, otiku. Are you listening to me? Otiku, otipari. Do you understand what I'm saying? And you, 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 you wonder also when you see women rising up in aggression. It takes a lot for a woman to rise up and kill her husband with a knife. Like, you know, one of the stories that came to light recently. And so we come to church and we're smiling. We come to church and we know all the Christianese. We come to church and we fit with everybody else. And we go back home to the sorrow and the pain and the shame, not speaking. And my question is, why? Is it that we don't trust ourselves? Is it that, you know, we, we are not sure we're going to get real help? Is it that we are more concerned about what our church looks like, you know, to the world than meeting the re needs of real people? We do a little bit of good now. You feed 10 people. It's on social media. Does not the Bible tell you that you're not supposed to let your light, the right hand know what your left hand is doing? Abi, is it not the same Bible we are reading? Kilon Shewa. Is somebody listening? Kilon Shewa. We need to look at it again. And you know, I think it was Jumoke who was speaking, who said, you need people around you to whom you are accountable. You know, because you, 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 you stand up and the Bible says you don't accuse an elder, except you have, you know, uh, but in the presence of two or three weaknesses. But sometimes that thing is turned against women and the elders are going scot-free because nobody wants to speak. 
Because nobody wants to be the scapegoat. And God's heart is bleeding for his women. Hallelujah. The Me Too movement must come to the church. It must come to the church. And Jesus initiates a conversation, you know. And sometimes we are so broken as women that when God, I'm laughing at Jumoke that says, I have to see this Jesus. I'd like to be a fly on the wall when Jesus appears to her. Maybe she'll first of all dive under the bed. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? And the woman is dazed. How? How can you a Jew? When was the last time an unbeliever looked at you and said, how can you be this good to me? You know, somebody, unbeliever is sweet. Your enemy. How? How? How, how can you do this to me in spite of all that I've been doing to you? The woman was totally surprised. Then she goes on. There were three levels of her how. This is my favorite test, you know, story in the Bible. The first one was how. She was really surprised. The second one was how. She was intrigued. Who is this audacious person who will break cultural norms? Who will break societal norms? To reach out to me. What price are you willing to pay for somebody else to be benefited? Not you. We, most of what we are doing has to do with the benefit we are going to reap from that situation. But what greater love hath no man but that he laid down his life. This is for his friend. Oh. But the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And we find it difficult to cross over to our neighbor to tell them, even if I don't love you, Christ loves you. Hallelujah. The next how was how? <laughs> who is this guy who is trying to chat me up? I mean, who we're not even supposed to be, you know, in, in, in whatever with, you know. And it's amazing how many times God comes to us with good but our brokenness will not allow us to receive it. We're defensive, we're uptight, you know, we've experienced disappointment time and time again, so that this time when good comes, we're very suspicious of the good. Today, many of us are going to let down our guards, and we're going to allow God to come in. It's not me that's coming in, it's not your neighbor that's coming in. Jesus himself wants to come into you today, hallelujah. In verses 10 to 12, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, one translation says, if you knew the generosity of God and who I am and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? And the first thing he says was, if you knew. You know, you'd expect that if God was going to introduce himself to someone, he would in introduce himself as the almighty God. Bow down now and worship me. And the one thing he introduces himself as is as a servant. He said, if you knew who was talking to you, the first thing you would do is ask. You, you, you. The Bible says, ask and you will receive. And we ask once, I've always read that um, verse in, in the light of persistent, persistence. Ask and keep on asking. That's not what God was saying. He said, ask. When you have gotten that, ask me again. When you have gotten that, ask me again. Be an Oliver twist with God. When you have finished asking for yourself, ask for your city. If that is enough, ask me for the nations. Ask me because I'm that kind of big, massive, inexhaustible God. Is somebody listening to me? The Bible says we have not because we ask not. And everybody is quickly, you know, wanting to tell you, hey, because you are going to consume on your own loss. Tear, ask no. Are you listening to me? The first thing he introduces himself as to this woman is as a need meter. He says, I want to meet your needs. One of the most um, curious verses for me in the Bible is when Nathan had come to um, confront 
um, David about taking Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. And God said to David, said to David, I gave you this, I gave you that, I gave you your master's wives. If they had not been enough, I would have given you more. God is saying to you, there is no reason for you to envy somebody else. Ask me. If what you have is not enough, ask for more. I will give it to you. I am the God that wants to meet your need. Glory to God. And then, you know, us intellectual people. Eh, the lady, go, I love this lady. She's got sass. She goes, you have nothing. <laughs> so I will give you living water. After, and you know, you look at her, you go, ah, ah, don't we do that? God says, I will do this for you. You go, mm, how are you going to do it? Only you have nothing. Only you don't have a bucket and the well is deep. And we trip over the buckets of our lives. What was this woman saying? I don't see what you have. And for some of you here, people have said to you, I don't see what you have. And because people have said they don't see it, you yourself have agreed you don't have anything. It doesn't matter what it is. As long as it is God-given, it has the power to overcome the world. If God called you to be a stay-at-home mom, be the best stay-at-home mom you can ever be. If God called you to be a worker, whether it is a cleric or clerical worker, please be the best that you can be. God is not depending on the promotion systems of the world to lift you up. He says promotion comes from him. He lifts one up, he sets one down. Is somebody listening to me? We have bought into the lie of the world. And many of us are striving every day. He says you have no idea what... He says there are things that I have prepared for you that have not even entered into the hearts of men. He says things that eyes have not seen, things that ears have not heard. When he was talking about asking, he said, ask that your joy might be full. If somebody listen to me, my father, you know, was in the legal um, um, profession. He was a judge. And when we were growing up, he first started out as a lawyer. And we, you know the way you're going back to school and you want to write your provision list, you know. He would tell us, make a case. I say my siblings, you know, had spoiled ground before I came along. Because they would write everything they didn't need and then double it. So my father finally cottoned on to them, and whatever they gave him, he would just half it. So Funana came along, first time going back to school, you know. I wrote exactly what I needed. He didn't even look at it. He just cut it in two. You know, and I was so upset. I went to my mom. My mom said, I went, I went, I went. <laughs> So he went to appeal to my father that, no, 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 these are the things that she really needed. And subconsciously inside of me, I would always make a case for things that I wanted, you know, from God. So one day, you know, I was going on about maybe something that I needed. And I heard, I'm not your father. I was like, ah, 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 you know, what he said was, I'm not like your father. What I heard was, I'm not your father. You know, so I was like, ah, Kimuashe. He said, you don't have to make a case. He said, ask me just because. Are you listening to me? He says, he's able to do exceeding abundantly above. He said, beyond your highest prayers. No, 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 no. There was an incident, I think it was sometime last year. You know, friends of mine in Norway we had had a situation where um, um, my, my daughter's, uh, my friend's um, daughter, her husband or the guy she was living with was abusing their four-year-old daughter. You know, and first of all, it took a while for her to notice, you know. And then the social services there, you know, kept insisting that, you know, um, they had to share the, the, the visits, you know, between the two parents because by then they had separated and all that sort of thing. You know, and uh, there, were coming, there was coming a court case where the, the man had filed and said that he wanted uh, not just sole custody, but he wanted unsupervised visits. They had the evidence. They had, you know, of course, the girl medically. You know, they, had, they saw the girl. They did everything. And these silly people, you know, at their whatever it was, you know, were actually going to go ahead with the case to determine what would happen. 
I'm driving one day and my friend calls me and goes, my daughter has got a gun. She's on her way to kill that guy. He was so, she was so distressed. She didn't know what to do. She was like, how can this continue? And of course, the, the girl was becoming withdrawn and all those sorts of things, you know. And she's talking to me and I was like, we have to pray now. She mustn't get to the destination. You know, my mouth is going, shiri ba 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 ba. My head is going, gone, gone. Bolo tiri, gone, gone. <laughs> you know, because I'm like, you know, a situation that you never imagined or <laughs> dreamed of. You know, and I'm like, okay. And truth to tell, I, we mumbled, you know, because it was like, God stop her. We, we don't we stop her. We don't even know what to do. I wait about 15 minutes and I call the daughter. And she picks up the phone. I'm like, hmm. But you know, I'm not supposed to know what is going on. <laughs> She's in Norway. I'm in Nigeria. You just don't call on the off chance. So I'm like, oh, nice, um, anxiety, less voice. How are you? <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> she goes, I'm at home. I'm like, oh, good. And then she breaks down and she begins to cry. She's so upset. She doesn't know what to do. I said, can we trust God? Why don't you just let's pray? By then, she was fed up. I trusted God. She let this happen to my daughter. It's still continuing. Now they want to give him unsupervised visits. What is going to happen? And you keep asking me to trust God. I, said, let, I don't know anything else to do. Let's just pray, you know. This was around um, November. The court case was coming up, you know, in um, January of the following year. And I was thinking, you know, to myself, God, you know, raise up somebody. We, we didn't even know what to pray. <laughs> My friend calls me two weeks later, and she goes, he's dead. You know, I'm, I was driving. My, I had one of my sisters in the car. I just screeched to her and packed. Sorry, I'm confused. I don't understand. He's, who is dead? The, 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 the girl's father. What happened? And, you know, my next thought is, oh, my God, did she go and shoot him finally? She said, No. He died in his sleep. You have no idea what God will do for you. You have no idea how much your pain touches God. You have no idea. I say, tell that story because sometimes we think it is our prayers. I'm not sure there was much faith in the prayers we prayed that day. But there was a God who was touched with the feelings of our infirmity who chose to go beyond our highest prayers. Are you listening to me? You might not be a princess, but you matter to him. Glory to God. And then he says that um, um, nothing that my intellect can see, nothing that is necessary to get the job done, you know. And then the other thing about you have nothing is, um, you have nothing that's different or, or what do you have that everybody else doesn't have? So how come this is going to get done? And you know, we're raising a generation that are becoming more and more intellectual and living the ways of the spirit. The Bible says Moses saw, uh, the children of Israel saw the works of God, but Moses knew his ways. And we need to return to knowing the ways of God. I heard another testimony that freaked me out, talking about buckets. You know, because we think if you are going to draw water from a well, at least you need a bucket. If it's not a bucket, then you need a pumping machine. You know? And uh, this guy, missionary guy, you know, um, um, was going to visit another nation. And the Lord had said to him, I will provide what you need to get there. Said to him, go to the airport. This is happening in our own vicinity says, go to the airport, you know, and um, um, I'll sort you out there. So, of course, he's thinking, I get to the airport. It must mean that he has prepared somebody to bring the ticket to me there. You know, so he gets there, gets to the counter. You know, um, I'm supposed to, you know, be on this flight. Let's say he's going to South Africa. You, know, ah. you see, all of you, you are going like that because nobody would believe God. Nobody would do it. And I wonder how many times we have missed out on glory because of this our head. 
So she, he, he's like, he gets there, and of course, they, they did exactly what you, I better go to one side. You know? So he's standing there and he's waiting, and he watches the counter close. So he goes up to them again, and you know, by then, they're beginning to mock him. One of these guys who's not quite okay there, you know, he wants to find a way to go somewhere. And so they, they really insulted and mocked him. And this, this, <laughs> this is an honorable man of God. Have you ever felt stupid when God asks you to do something and the outcome just is not what you expected? He was embarrassed. He was insulted. But the most, you know, painful thing was, did I really hear God? So no, 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 me, me, Abi, you know. He, and you've made such a public fool of yourself. He goes into the toilet and he weeps. Also do. Because he still has the luggage and by then every other stand in the airport has closed. Takes his stuff into the toilet and he wept. He was so pained. He said, God, what is all this about? You know, I'm not the kind of person that... I don't have to go to the nation and he on me, you know. And after a while, wipes his eyes and is like, oh, I better find my way back home. Opens the door and steps out into the airport lobby of the nation he was supposed to go. Did someone hear me? Steps out into the lobby of the airport that he was supposed to have gone to. How? Eba me saw, eba me saw. No be bucket. I say it's not bucket. Every one of us, we think we believe God. We think we, we release God to do what he can do. But really, we all have a bucket. If God doesn't do it by a bucket way, we let it go. Is somebody listening to me? That's what the woman said. You waiting, oh, you have no bucket. Help me tell your neighbor, he does not need a bucket. <laughs> Hallelujah. And God has more than one ways, or <laughs> be one way to get to you what he needs to get you done. You know, and the Bible says in God resides all the treasures and riches of wisdom and knowledge. The second thing the woman says is the well is deep. Sometimes we think our own problem cannot be solved. God, you don't understand how complicated this thing is. It's very complicated. God is the only one that can unscramble scrambled eggs. So when you have a scrambled egg situation, just give it to him. Hallelujah. But this woman doesn't finish. She continues. I really love this woman. You see, because for me, she, she, she does publicly everything that we do secretly. You know, sometimes we're just sassing God. And the next thing she goes is, who do you think you are? Our fathers get, oh, Chabala Kadaya. Try and say, who do you think you are to Pastor Falake? You will hear when. <laughs> Try and say, who do you think you are to any me? I first of all, look you up and say, it's not Shomo Age Mini. <laughs> do you want, that was in effect what she said to God. Say, who do you think you are? You want to draw water from where you don't have bucket? And you're telling me I will give you living water? Our fathers, hallelujah, our fathers, and you don't know how many times we have tripped on our fathers. It's changing. He says his mercies are new every morning. Are you Yoruba say? There is wisdom in high and low places. There are things that the fathers know that you do not. There are things you know that the fathers do not. The Bible says that out of the mouth of babes, God has ordained strength. You see, you have to understand that any wisdom that comes forth is from God. Kenneth Copeland tells the story of when he was a young believer. Whenever he had a question, quack, 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 he was going to call his mentor. Quack, 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 he was going to call his mentor. One day he was on his way to call his mentor and he gets interrupted and he hears, where do you think he gets it from? 
You know, he thought somebody walked into the room and he looks around and they say, who are you, <laughs> Mr. Samaritan woman? Who are you? He says, I'm the Holy Spirit. I am the one that tell them everything that they know. Ask. Somebody say, ask. He says in Jeremiah 33.3, ask and I will show you great and mighty things that you don't know. I like the Amplified. He says, fenced in and hidden things that you don't know. Is somebody listening to me? Then he gives us another tool, these wonderful tongues that we pray in. He says in Corinthians, he says that when you begin to speak, you are speaking mysteries to God in tongues. A mystery is not something you can't understand. It's something that's hidden for a day of revelation. Are you listening to me? We have access to wisdom beyond this world. And we are shortchanging ourselves. Amen. You don't do away with the fathers. But you understand that God is the father from whom all fatherhood takes its title and derives its name. Oh, and many times we stunt our growth. Because rather than going to God, we do not want to pay the price for the intimacy that will bring revelation to us in God. God, you, you must call him Eleti Baroi. Just tell me, okay, good. They, they call him um, Eleti Baroi. And you need to understand something when you speak. God judges hearts, motives, intents, events, circumstances, and the counsels of darkness against you. When you speak to God, he hears your heart. He hears what you have not spoken. He hears what you cannot say. He hears what you don't know to say. He knows why it came out the way it did. And he knows your thoughts are far off. So sometimes when I speak to you and you think I'm sassing you, if I did that with God, God knows all of the circumstances that made what I said come out the way it did. One of the things that Paul says, I don't know where it is now. He says, I don't judge anything, not even myself. He says, I wait for God who reveals the counsels of darkness against me. Some of you don't know what some people fought um, um, with to get to this place today. You have no idea what they, 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 they had to go through and overcome to be seated here and smiling. You have no idea, but God does. So when, you know, you're saying, praise the Lord, and somebody is going crazy wild, praising the Lord, another person is just going... I praise you. And you are looking at the one that says, And God knows that that was okay. The effort it took to do that is more than everybody else took jumping up and down. God sees your heart and he knows. Hallelujah. Let me just, just be quick with this. I'll, I'll stop wherever the time says stop. Okay. And in, in 13 and 15, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become to them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Again, Jesus says, I'm your thirst quen quencher. Whatever the need is, whatever you're thirsting for, authenticity, affection, intimacy, purity, significance, relevance, provision, security, whatever it is, he's your thirst quencher. And you know, he's offering you a life that is rich, a life that is colorful, a life that he created for the original version of you. So whatever has marred that original version, God wants to restore here this morning. And you want to understand, but what's your why for what, what he has to offer? You know, she, she said, give me this water so I won't come, keep coming back. That was convenience. Then she said, sometimes, you know, she came to the well when there was nobody there. Because being there meant that, you know, there was something very painful about her life. So some of us, we want Jesus so that the pain can stop. And then, you know, again, sometimes we want Jesus for empowerment. Jesus, give me this water so I can start my pure water business. <laughs> and God is going to strike back. And God says, and I'm going to end on this note. God says, go and call your husband. Oh, hallelujah. Go and call your husband. What was Jesus saying to her? Go and bring to me the source of your pain. Go and bring to me that one thing that has caused you shame, 
has caused you despair, that thing that is causing you to doubt me, go and bring that thing to me. And the lady answers her and the lady says, I have no husband. That is to say, we are not going there. And Jesus answered her, Mba, it's not that you don't have one uh, a husband. You have had five and the one you're living with is not your husband. And what Jesus is saying is, I waited in the sun all day to come to this point. You're not going to put me off. Yoruba uh, say, Egberu Samuel, Kule Samuel, Lowo. Whatever it is that is giving you pain, if you think you are going to get away and sit in pain all of your life, you've got another thing coming. If you think you are going to struggle with God and you are going to win, you've got another thing coming. He loves you more than anything darkness has against you. He has paid the price for it. He has paid the price for you. And he ain't going to rest. He's not going to get off your case until beauty comes out of your life. Are you listening to me? He is a persistent God. He is a relentless God. He is a God that does not give up on you even after you have given up on yourself. Are you listening to me? I've come to announce to you, baby girl, that you're going to make it. That by the time you see him, you are going to be like him. I don't care what they say about the church. I don't care what it is that we're all doing wrong right now. Tamafi, get back in place. He knows the hugs. He knows those that need hugs. He knows those that need cane. So he knows what to do. He said, I'm coming back for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. And if we start believing from that point, we will treat one another differently. Are you listening to me? You are going to become a glorious church. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I know he's going to do it. I know amongst us, we're going to see the dead raised. I know we're going to begin to see the lame walk. I know we're going to see blind eyes open. But I know the only way that we're going to see that is to at least begin to do it. Let's pray for a few dead people. Are you listening to me? Let's pray for a few sick people. Ikonuwa will be healed. Are you listening to me, somebody? It's this same friend of mine. And you know what amuses me about her relationship? She's in no way. She's not here. She's not on Terra Farmer. The other day she called and, she, you know, she was quite ill. And then by the following day she told me they're taking her by air ambulance to another city there. You know, and I'm like, what, what do you mean, Em? What's the problem? Says they have to do emergency surgery, you know, because there's something that's wrong with my heart. So what are you talking about? You know, and I was, at first I was, you know, God, what is all this about? So he said, can we pray? I like her, her famous line is, all I know to do is pray, you know. So he said, can we pray? Again, we mumbled prayer. You know, and the, the operation was scheduled for 10 um, a.m. the following uh, morning. She was flown over overnight, you know. And then about 12 p.m., I see a post on Facebook, you know, and she's the one that has posted. I'm like, are you dissing me? Aren't you supposed to be in surgery? You know, what, what's, what, I really was confused. What's going on? You know, and then I was afraid to call her. So I called her daughter, who was supposed to have gone with her. And she said, no, I couldn't go with mom because something happened. But yes, you know, she's, she's been flown to Troinheim and, you know. Uh, I said, but she just posted on Facebook. She goes, ah, yes, I forgot to tell you. When they got there, they couldn't find anything wrong with her. <laughs> And he talked about Dura will believe Bolo Madam. Is somebody listening to me? I'm trying to show you my infirmity so that you don't think this is some super spirituality. The reason we are getting results is because we are at least doing. You have to start doing. Do the works of God. He says, and you know the first step? He said, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered, this is the work of God, that you believe. That you believe. I've just said to God, ruin the disbelief in me. Put me in situations where I have to believe you. Do you understand? I said all of this to say this to you. You might not be the princess that people are routing for. You are his daughter. You are his daughter. He says, you know, what we shall be has not yet appeared. 
He says, but when we see him, we're going to be like him. And then another verse says, as he is, so are we. Jesus is not the one that was healing two, three, four, five blind people. Oh. As he is now, is king of glory. As he is now, is the roaring lion. As he is now, is governor over the nations. He's not that gentle Jesus, meek and mild again. Oh. When he comes back, there will be a sword in his mouth. And he will be accompanied by thousands and thousands, uncountable angels. Is somebody listening to me? And God says, that is how we are now. I, I have this thing on my mirror. It says, when you tell me, blah, I tell you, mm, can't share. That's not how I look. Do you understand? I'm praying that this has touched you somehow. But you know the last thing he said, when that woman started spouting religion, Jesus said to her, he said, I know, okay, I know. if you wanted to start again with our fathers worshipped on this, there was something I wanted to read. Go and read that verse, in fact, please let me end with that, let me read it. Because you need to understand something. This is when um, the woman started spouting religion again. And Jesus answered her and said, believe me, woman, the time is coming. I'm reading from the message translation. When you Samaritans will worship the Father, neither here at this mountain nor there in Jerusalem, you worship guessing in the dark. We Jews worship in the clear light of day. God's way of salvation is made available through the Jews. But the time is coming. It has in fact come when what you are called will not matter and where you go to worship will not matter. It is who you are and the way you live that count before God. Your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. That's the kind of people the Father is out looking for. Those who are simply and honestly themselves before him in their worship. God is sheer being itself, spirit. Those who worship him must do it out of their very being, their spirits, their true selves in adoration. The woman said, I don't know about that. I do know that the Messiah is coming. When he arrives, we'll get the whole story. I am he, said Jesus. You don't have to wait any longer or look any further. And all I've come to Jumoke, he's here. The encounter you want can be now. Not even later in the night can be now. You don't have to wait for him anymore. What do you want him to do? Ask. And we're going to do that right now. Ask. It's not a long prayer. This is what I want, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, amen. <laughs> I'm asking together with Jumoke, encounter Lord. <laughs> Do you hear me? Ask him. Don't ask small. <laughs> ask that your joy might be full. Some of you already have what you need. Say, ma, fear, only ask ask him he spoke about something he said they said this is going to be really tough you know talking about the rich entering the kingdom of heaven and he said with men it is possible he said but with God all things are possible ask him Ask him. Ask him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
There's one more thing that I also want us. There are Samaritans that you have an appointment with. And God has put in you what they need. Also ask God to set up that appointment that he has with your Samaritan. Lord, we want to so overflow with your love. We want to so experience your love in us. Lord, we're open to you today. Father, let your love damage our unbelief. You know that boy's father said, I believe, help my unbelief. And in the areas where we're struggling, oh Lord, help our unbelief in the name of Jesus. Father, we want to say thank you ahead of time for the testimonies that are going to come from this time of asking. We just know you're going to do exceeding abundantly above, beyond anything that we've asked now. We know you're going to fill us full of joy and that that joy is going to overflow. We just want to say thank you for putting together this meeting just so you can meet us. We're so grateful and we bless you in Jesus' name.